Okay, hello everybody and welcome back to another Kati Virtual Academy session. My name is Christina Ung and I'm with the marketing team at Kati. I help put these sessions together. So thank you so much for joining us today. Today's topic is parametric study with ANSYS Fluent. Um, our speaker today is Snigda Sarkar. She's back leading this session. So thank you for joining us. If you have any questions, please submit them via the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and we'll do our best to address them either during the session or at the end. All of these sessions are available on our YouTube channel as well as on our website. Um, we have a few that we've actually already done kind of around this topic that you can check out um, if you'd like. I also want to invite you all to our upcoming Manufacturing Innovation Series workshops. Um, we have a few on our site already, but there's a few coming out in 2024 as well as a virtual session on January 10th. Um, so if you can't go to any of the in-person sessions, we'd love for you to join us for a virtual one. And you can register, you can um, scan with your phone the QR code, or you can check out the link I just dropped in the chat. Okay, great. Without further ado, I will hand things over to Snigda. Thank you guys again for joining. Thank you, Christina. Um, welcome, everybody. Good morning. My name is Snigda Dirk Sarkar. I'm simulation practice lead here at Kativ Technologies. And today we're going to be talking about um, doing parametric study using ANSYS Fluent Solver. Um, this is, I think, our third session in this series. We're exploring different tools and methods of um, using various ANSYS software for doing parametric um, analysis or doing design optimization. Uh, today's session is going to be focusing on Fluent. Um, the past sessions uh, talked a little bit about uh, using ANSYS Discovery. And then I think the previous session focused on ANSYS Workbench. If you're interested in those sessions, please feel free to check them out on YouTube. Um, so let's dive right in and talk about today's agenda. Um, I'm going to go ahead and start with introducing the Fluent Parametric Workflow a little bit, highlight a few major differences that you'll notice uh, if you are a frequent, um, you know, CFT user, or if you're very familiar with the ANSYS environment, you might um, use these sessions to gauge, you know, which tool works the best for your needs. Um, and that is one of the primary objectives of this series. So we'll talk a little bit about that. And then most of this session is going to be, um, you know, a demo example uh, wherein we see how to set up a parametric analysis of workflow inside the Fluent Solver. And then I'm going to briefly touch on how you can combine the parametric workflow inside Fluent with mesh morphing um, technology, uh, a very powerful capability that the ANSYS Fluent Solver has, which will also allow you to make design changes and parameterize those parameters instead of just playing with um, um, your CFD variables in terms of setup. Um, like Christina mentioned, if you have any questions, feel free to leave it in the chat window and I'll get to them towards the end of the session. All right, so with that, let's begin. Um, just a little bit of context and background into why design optimization is so important. I think we've spoken about this before. Um, two of the primary initiatives, especially in the manufacturing industry that we see is how do you reduce cost and how do you reduce time to market? And we've seen that really it depends on how early you're able to optimize your design. The sooner it is in the product development cycle and the design cycle, more the cost saving, uh, more the time saving. And that is why, you know, leveraging simulation, leveraging different tools that ANSYS has to offer in order to make those right design decisions uh, becomes key in uh, significantly reducing development cost and time to market, um, especially in today's day and age where engineers are wearing multiple hats. Uh, they may not just be relegated to design duties, duties or analysis duties. They might be doing both. So having a tool like Fluent that can help you with both the analysis portion and the design optimization portion uh, can really, you know, cut um, the engineering time by a lot and make that process more efficient. So that's, you know, what we're going to focus on today. How do you leverage Fluent um, to, you know, make some of these changes? 
Now, in terms of Fluent Parametric Workflow, what's so unique about it is you can go ahead and conduct parametric simulations from within your Fluent Solver without having to rely on Workbench or any other uh, pre-processing tool. Um, now, we've talked about discovery, which was which can be more of a pre-processing tool or a simulation tool, however you decide to use it. And in the last session, we talked about using Workbench, which is more of a project management tool for doing your design optimization. Uh, so what's unique about Fluent is now we're in the solver stage, right? So this is where you set up your case. This is where you run your simulation. So to be able to set up your parametric analysis inside a single GUI without having to go back and forth, uh, makes it a more user-friendly and more convenient process. Uh, you can sweep over any of the input parameters defined in Fluent, and this could you know, range from material properties to cell zone conditions, boundary conditions, uh, any type of expressions or variables that you're defining for yourself. And uh, similarly, on the output side, um, if you're looking at flux reports, report definitions, if you're looking again at expressions, uh, you can compute values and set those up as output parameters um, in this parametric workflow analysis. Um, the good thing about Fluent, and hopefully we'll see this in the demo, is that the design point creation and parameter management is a lot easier, uh, it's user friendly, and it's easy to sort of, you know, submit your design points and monitor the jobs while the simulation is running or while the individual design points are converging, right? Um, and the best part, right, the highlight of using Fluent for using parametric for doing parametric workflow analysis is the integrated reports that you can generate wherein you compare different design points um, and summarize the results. You can look at post-processing data for each individual design point, but also be able to compare them with each other. And we'll see that you don't even need fluent to do that, uh, you can generate interactive HTML reports that work outside of fluent. So even if you're passing on that report to somebody else in your team who doesn't have access to fluent or maybe doesn't know CFT, they can still make you know sense of that report. So it makes your engineering workflow uh, a lot more seamless and efficient. Um, you can you know manage and organize your files much more easily, right? You know, individual data files for all the design points that you're running and, you know, the project archiving extraction um, or, you know, the optional retention of data files, all that becomes a lot easier if you're using something like the parametric workflow um, instead of, you know, relying on um, other um, workbench type tools. Okay, so um, I also have a slide on the latest capabilities uh, that have been recently added this year, in fact, in this latest release of ANSYS Fluent, but I think it makes sense for us to directly jump to the demo so that once we're done with the demo, you have a little bit more context about the latest updates to the capabilities, um, and it makes a lot more sense at that point. Okay, so with that said, let's, you know, jump into, a, you know, a fluent session. I have two sessions open right now. Uh, in one, you know, my case is already solved. I already have the baseline case and data loaded and solved. And in another case, I have a parametric workflow project solved, just, you know, save on the runtime. And we'll go through both these cases to see uh, how we go from setting up parameters uh, to, you know, making use of the design point table. Okay, so let me go ahead and, you know, explain the problem statement a little bit. So I'm just going to go ahead and display the mesh over here. So what we have over here is a static mixer, a simple case. There are no moving parts in this particular problem. Uh, we have two inlets in this internal flow case. Um, we have a different velocity and temperature at this inlet, different temperature and velocity at this inlet, and we have an outlet over here at the top. Right now, fluid from these two inlets are coming in at different temperatures, different velocities. We want to see how they mix with each other, and then what's the temperature of the fluid as it outputs 
uh, out of the surface over here. Okay, so basically the velocity and temperature at these two surfaces are going to be our input parameters and the temperature at the uh, outlet surface is going to be our output parameter. That is what we are interested in. Okay, um, now like I said, this case is already solved. Um, so whenever you start with your parametric flow analysis, you can set up your geometry mesh and you know run the baseline case um, as it is. Okay, just like you would any other particular fluent problem. Um, so, you know, you have your case set up over here, but you'll also notice that some of the results, such as contours, et cetera, are already loaded. Okay. Now, there is a reason why, you know, I have the results already loaded for this particular case, and that is because um, I want these same results to be output for each design point. Uh, or each variation that I make in my overall parametric workflow. So I don't want to keep setting this up every time for each and every design point. I just want to set it up for my baseline case. And then uh, whichever successive iterations I do, the same settings will apply uh, to those cases, right? So I only need to do this job once, all right? So here, say, for example, you're looking at a cut plane through the inlet um, through the two inlets of the static mixer. And you can see how the fluid is mixing. This is for the velocity. If you look at the temperature contour, uh, you'll be able to see that, you know, hot liquid is coming in from one end uh, and relatively colder uh, is coming in from the other. So we want to be able to compare this uh, with other design points as we keep setting this up. All right. Now let's look at the... Um, settings for this particular problem. I started with the results because I wanted to uh, make a point about the convenience of using parametric workflow inside Fluent. But if I wanted to, you know, go ahead and see the input conditions, let me right click on setup and click on modified settings summary. Um, I'm sure a lot of you already know about this, but this is a quick way to gain an overview or an understanding of, you know, what all changes you've made um, in your Fluent setup. Only those, you know, options get highlighted that have changed or, you know, that have been given a different value than the default value. So you can see that the energy is turned on because we're doing like a thermal mixing problem. And you will also notice that there are some boundary conditions that have been assigned at inlet one and inlet two. Now, instead of having a constant value for the velocity and temperature at the inlets, you have an expression. Right. And that's the point. These expressions act as your input parameters that you're later on going to vary in your parametric workflow. You will not see outlet in this list of boundary conditions because I'm assuming that, you know, it's just uh, default gauge pressure is zero. So, you know, that hasn't really been changed, which is why it doesn't show up over here. OK, so let's, you know, open up one of these context menus and see what's actually happening. So I can just double click on temperature from here. Don't really need to go back to the outline view. Um, and so this opens this dialog box, right, for the velocity at inlet one. Again, like I said, instead of having a constant value for the velocity, what you probably end up doing is click on this drop down menu and then select a new input parameter, right? So this is how you define your input parameter. By the way, you know, you also do this when you're setting up your parametric analysis inside Workbench. So that process is not really very different. If you were to do, say, for example, a design optimization or parametric analysis inside Workbench, and you wanted fluent variables to be input output parameters, you follow the same process, right? So that remains the same. In this case, you know, we have an um, input parameter already set up, so I'm not going to play around with it. But uh, just to make sure that, you know, this is noted, even the temperature at the inlets is assigned as an input parameter. OK, so let me go ahead and close this. And just, you know, for the sake of giving you guys an example, I can go to the outlet. Right now, the pressure at the outlet is zero gauge which is constant, which is a default value. But if I had to, you know, vary this, I could just go ahead and assign this as another input parameter. 
The moment I do that, the expression box opens up and you can assign it a different name. Say for example, I want to name it GP for gauge pressure. Um, what you wanna make sure is that this box is checked uh, obviously, because I'm opening it from the field and I selected input parameter, this is automatically checked. But if you were to create a new expression from scratch, this would not be checked by default. And in that case, you would have to remember to check this depending on whether this is an input parameter or an output parameter. Okay, so I could just go ahead and hit OK. And the moment I do that, uh, you should see that under named expressions, I have another variable, um, another input parameter that gets populated in the list. Um, temperature, velocity at both the inlets are already there. Okay. Now, this is about input parameters, right? What about output parameters? So output parameters can also, like I said, um, depend on you know what type of solution you're looking for. In this case, we already have a report definition for the average temperature at the outlet of the static mixer. Remember, that was the objective of the simulation. We want to see what is the temperature at the outlet. So if I double click on this guy, you will see that this is the mass weighted average of the temperature at the outlet, okay? And you'll also notice that this little box over here at the bottom which says create output parameter is checked, okay? So let's go ahead and make a new output parameter. Just if you're unfamiliar with the process, I wanna give you guys an example. Let me just go ahead and make this another mass weighted average. But this time instead of uh, temperature, let me look at the velocity at the outlet. I'm interested in that as well. So I could just give it a different name. And then before I hit OK, I want to make sure that I check this create output parameter box. All right. Now remember, this case has already been solved, right? Even though I'm entering more expressions, uh, I don't really have to repeat the solve in order to get some values. So, you know, I could um, come here and just right click on this guy and go ahead and compute this. It's going to give me the temperature at the outlet and also the uh, velocity at the outlet for the solved case already. But um, in case you know, you're setting up a case from scratch, you won't have these values until and unless you know you run the simulation. So that's another thing to keep in mind. Okay, so now that I have set up my case, I know my input parameters, I know my output parameters, a good best practice is to just go down this list in the outline view and come to parameters and customization. Why? Because if you expand parameters, it's gonna give you a breakdown of all the input parameters and all the output parameters in one go. So if you have too many parameters in your problem and you know perhaps you don't wanna forget about anything or you, know, you don't want to miss out on any uh, settings, you might wanna come here and double check that everything looks good to go. <clears throat> before you switch to a more uh, parametric workflow analysis, okay? So this looks right to me. Um, and, you know, now we just want to go ahead and set up our design point table. So the way to do that is... Um, go to this parametric tab over here. Um, you should see it. Uh, in all recent versions over here. And this is where, you know, you would go ahead and set up your parametric workflow. And we are going to go ahead and hit initialize, okay? So the case is going to be initialized with the case that is currently loaded. So I'm just gonna go ahead and hit initialize. It's gonna ask me if I want to create a new project. I'm gonna go ahead and say yes. We'll name it something different so that the previous one doesn't get overridden. And I'm just gonna go ahead and um, show you the result, uh, sorry, show you the parametric workflow in this particular view, okay? Now, um, you'll obviously notice that the GUI looks a bit different once you uh, initialize this parametric workflow, okay? Uh, the GUI looks different because now we're in the parametric workflow um, 
view and you'll notice that the outline view looks a bit different. There's more focus on the uh, parametric study and the biggest difference is that you see this design point table which opens up as a tab right next to graphics. Okay, this has a single row right now because we only have one case solved. We are going to add more rows and build out this design point table, just like we would if we were to use Workbench. Um, now, another thing that I forgot to mention is that um, I am using CFD Premium, but if you are um, using CFD Pro instead, uh, you will still be able to access the parametric tab inside your Fluent Solver. OK, so this is available for both the lower and higher versions of Fluent. And um, one of the reasons why it's available in the lower versions of Fluent is you might not have access to Workbench. So you may not be able to set up um, an optimization or a parametric analysis inside Workbench, but having this capability into your in your solver definitely helps, right? So you can still do your parametric analysis even if you don't have access to Workbench. Um, so just keep that in mind, all right? Now, um, coming back to this design point table, um, you will notice that it looks very similar to what you'd see in Workbench if you've been a frequent user of that. Uh, very self-explanatory. The first few columns are input parameters. It is denoted by I slash P. The last two columns are output parameters um, denoted by O slash P. And because the data file for this current case is already available, this write data column is check marked. And you'll also notice that the status of this project is converged, right? Because this um, solution was already there. You can change the visibility of these columns by clicking on this guy over here. Uh, so say, for example, one of these columns is not relevant to me. Maybe I'm not going to retain the data for future iterations. Uh, I could just go ahead and hide that column. I'm not going to play around with it right now, but you could just keep the ones that interest you. All right. And uh, along with the design point table, let me go ahead and collapse this. You will also notice on the left that the um, case view uh, is a little bit different than the standard um, outline view. The parameters and customization tab is automatically expanded. So this gives you a good idea of the values of the input parameters as uh, they are available for the current case, okay? Um, please note that, you know, uh, in the brackets over here next to the baseline case, you have current mentioned. So this is the case that is currently loaded. So this is what is shown in case view. As you keep solving more and more rows or adding more design point tables, you can change the current analysis from, say, for example, base DP to DP1, DP2, and automatically you will notice that all these values get updated to reflect the current case that's loaded. Um, so that is another um, thing to keep in mind, especially if you're looking at any one particular iteration more closely than others. Okay. Uh, a few other things at the bottom, uh, the parametric study view, it shows you some data related to the design point table itself. Uh, we'll go through it um, once we uh, you know, generate some results or, you know, look at the plots and reports that are associated um, with the design point table. So just to show you an example, I can go ahead and say, for example, add another design point. Automatically, a row will be added. You can add however many you want. Right now, I am choosing my design point table manually. So say, for example, I want to go ahead and vary my velocity five, six, seven, whatever, or, you know, you want to sort of uh, change the temperature at, you know, your second inlet, um, first inlet, you know, you can go ahead and evaluate various what if scenarios, right? I'm not going to click on write data because I don't want to unnecessarily increase storage. Uh, all I'm interested in is this value over here, right? Um, plus, I also have some results pre-populated in my baseline case, so I can just carry that over without actually having to open up a data file for individual cases. However, if you do want to have that option of going back to a case later on, 
and looking at it in detail, then go ahead and write the data file, right? So it gets um, stored um, automatically if you check the box. Uh, like I said, this particular column shows the status. We haven't run anything yet. And so it is telling you that this needs update. Um, I could go ahead and, you know, update any one particular design point, or I could just update all, which would uh, by default sequentially start solving these design points in the background one by one. Okay. Uh, one new capability, well, not new, this has been um, uh, available, I think, since 2022 or two, but originally you could, um, you know, run concurrent solves, meaning, you know, um, simultaneously simultaneously solve multiple design points, uh, I think, on a shared memory machine only. But now in 2023, you can, you know, do it on any sort of parallel computing environment that you have. And if you have questions about how to sort of submit the job or distribute the job, feel free to reach out to us and, you know, we'd be happy to help you. Uh, especially if you want to leverage your high performance computing licensing, right? You want to make these runs as efficient as possible. So you can definitely leverage HPC licensing to, you know, split the workload and, you know, get your overall results of the analysis faster. So if you're interested in that, feel free to reach out to us. We'd be happy to help you with that. Okay. Now, Another thing that I'm going to briefly touch upon and maybe talk about in detail in our next session is um, how to, you know, include or incorporate OptiSlang into your Fluent Parametric Workflow. Now, it's okay if you are just looking at, you know, three, four different scenarios and trying to understand which one gives you better results. But what if you want to build out a DOE design of experiment to ensure that you're exploring the entire design space and making sure all interactions and relations between different parameters are captured. It's manually with hidden trial, you won't be able to get there, right? Or it might be too tedious. So you can use OptiSlang, which is another ANSYS optimization tool. If you have the license for it, you could go ahead and um, add design points automatically. So I'm gonna go ahead and hit add design points. And what it's going to do is it's going to open up this dialog box that gives me options of choosing different, you know, sampling algorithms and statistical uh, models to build out my DOE that fully lets me explore the design space with an intelligent set of, um, you know, input parameters. Here, you know, we have a lower bound and upper bound for all the input parameters that you see right now in my table. And, um, you know, the default is 100 samples between the lower and the upper bound, right? So if I go ahead and click on create design points, it's going to look for my OptiSlang license and try to populate my design point table automatically. With the latest release, after your analysis is complete, you could also just take this result and post process the optimization quantities inside um, OptiSlang if you wanted to. So uh, this, this option of go to OptiSlang would do exactly that. So you'd have a lot more understanding, a lot more visibility into the overall design space and perhaps that will help you identify the best design candidates even better, okay? So because I selected 100 sample points, you can see that it automatically built out my DOE for me. So I could just let it run in the background and forget about it, right? So um, that would basically do the job. So I'm just going to go ahead and delete the design points because we're not going to run it at this point. But I just wanted to make sure that you guys are aware of that capability. Okay, now, so let me go ahead and open this other um, Fluent case that I already solved. This is a parametric workflow project that has already been solved uh, for the sake of saving time. So let me go ahead and hide this. And I'll show you this manual design point table that I originally created. And this has um, one of the outlook output parameters already populated because these cases have converged, okay? Um, the way to, you know, open this type of a fluent session is you go to 
file parametric project and then open a file um, with the extension .flprj. So you don't really need to open any one individual case. You could just open the project and that would give you access to the solved design point table as you see on the screen. Okay. Now, the other thing that I wanted to stress uh, on is the parametric report, right? So on the left over here under case view, you see simulation report. So if you double click on report outline um, under task page, the simulation report outline or settings, these open up. A lot of you might already be familiar with this as a standard post-processing in your Fluent sessions. So whether or not you're using parametric workflow, you can always export a report um, for any Fluent case study for which you have results, right? But with parametric workflow, this gets even better because like I said, you can compare the same results for various design points. So I can compare DP1 with DP2, current with DP3. So you can play around with the results to see which one makes more sense. Um, these are the settings for the report, by the way. You don't really need to include all these tabs, but basically from the case information to the setup, to the post-processing results and the scenes that you create, everything can be included in that report. Okay, so I'm just gonna open it separately in an HTML file in just a second because it takes a minute or two to generate the report depending on how much data you're trying to capture. Again, you don't necessarily need to capture everything. If you're only interested in results, you may not want to you know, include the setup, et cetera. Right. And by the way, um, you could have all the design points included in the same parametric report. But if you wanted to focus on any one design point, you could also just choose individual reports depending on the design point that you're most interested in. OK. And once that report is generated, you can view it inside the Fluent GUI itself. Or you could also just go ahead and you know export this as a PDF or a standalone HTML. I think you also have the option of exporting it as PowerPoint if I'm not wrong. Um, so that option should also be there in the latest version of Fluent. Okay, so I'm just gonna go ahead and show you this report. Just give me one second. So this should open up in any browser, this HTML report that I generated earlier. Again, you don't need Fluent for this. You could send it to anybody in your team, even if they're not analysts or CFD users, and they should be able to make sense of this report on their own. Uh, because I included all the section you see from the beginning, you know, all the table of contents, right? You see the models, you see the material properties, you could keep expanding them to get more um, visibility into the setup. Like say, for example, the boundary conditions for individual inlets, outlets, etc. everything is included over here. Okay. And the most important part is this design point table, right? This is what you're doing the parametric analysis for. So whatever results you have, they get carried over. And um, you could also just directly skip to the results portion. Remember, we had the contour set up in the baseline case. Well, now you have that available for each of your design points. So this is for design point zero. You could go to design point one, design point two, design point three, and then see how your results are changing as you've made the changes to your design point table, okay? So the vectors are available as well, and so are the path lines. Now, another cool feature is that you would click on this tab over here called Condor Comparison, and you could look at these results side by side to see exactly what is happening. So I think in the last case, I had the same temperature fluid coming in from both inlet one and inlet two. So you obviously see a stark difference between the results, okay? So this is very nifty, you know, when you have to compare many different scenarios and then come up with the best possible solution, okay? So you have LICs over here. And like I said, you can also just have different scenes by combining different post-processing results. And, you know, you can look at everything all together. All right, so going back to Fluent, 
Um, you have all these results output in the simulation report that you just saw. I do want to talk about something called the parametric plot. And this is uh, in relation to this small tab here at the bottom. So of course, this talks about the uh, report settings under parametric reports, which we just went over. But another cool thing that you can do while your simulation is running is you could look at the variation of uh, different input and output parameters with respect to the design points that you've created. So say, for example, this guy over here uh, plots design points on the x-axis and the output temperature, which was one of our uh, output parameters on the y-axis. So you can see as you went from design baseline design to the fourth design iteration, how this value has changed, okay? And you can create various uh, such plots. You know, you don't have to just stick to design points uh, or even output parameters for that matter of fact. Um, like in this case, um, I had changed the inlet temperature for the last design point, right? So if I went ahead and looked at how I have varied my inputs, I can see that for the first three iterations, it remained constant, and then I went ahead and changed it. So that information is also available to you, and this is also part of your report. So if I go back to my report, I think you'll be able to see the parametric plots as well, okay? So this is available to you, um, and much easier to use than sort of comparing different design points inside Workbench, okay? Now, while the simulations run, right? So say, for example, I hit update all and each iteration is running in the background. You should be able to see the graphics and the residuals just like you would do in a normal Fluent case. If you just go back to graphics, right now, you know, everything is already solved, so you don't see anything, but you should be able to just come here and look at the monitors while the simulation is running. So that visibility is also available to you if you're using this type of a parametric workflow analysis. All right, so that's all I wanted to cover in terms of parametric workflow setup and the GUI itself. But let me talk briefly about mesh morphing, which again is a whole different topic on its own. And if you guys are interested in mesh morphing capabilities or want to see a demo example using the Fluent Adjoint Solver, uh, please let us know in the comments and we can do a separate session that goes over how to do, you know, goal-oriented optimization, uh, you know, inside Fluent itself. We can cover that. But really quickly, I wanted to show you guys an example <clears throat> um, for this particular case. So let me go ahead and actually read in a fresh uh, case over here just really quickly. Just so that, you know, it's a little bit more clear. And while this case is loading, I think I have a question. So I, I've, I've received a question about the optimization of a shell and tube heat exchanger to maximize the heat transfer. And I think you have a goal or you know a specific question that you're trying to answer, right? So is there something called goal optimization inside ANSYS Fluent? Yes, there is. And that is exactly what I was referring to over here is using a joint solver, you can um, define certain observables and certain target values or trends that you want to see in those variables, okay? And, um, let me just close this and launch a fresh Fluent. So yeah, that is exactly what I was talking about, that if you're um, working with the adjoint solver, you can define um, observables or your, your expected deliverables out of your uh, CFD analysis. And you can understand the sensitivity of each of these observables uh, depending on their relations with each other and the rest of the setup in your problem. And you can target 
uh, certain values, percentage increase, percentage decrease, um, or you know, you just want to sort of let them change in a free form manner uh, by making certain changes in your design and see, you know, how your um, uh, how Fluent is able to predict, say, for example, a particular shape that will help you meet that target. And that's, you know, using something called the adjoint solver. Uh, we are going to briefly touch upon it in today's particular example, just because I want to show you how to uh, set that up as a design parameter. But like I said, it's a whole of different topic altogether, a very useful capability that a lot of our customers use today, especially in the aerospace and defense industry, or even in the thermal industry for that matter of fact. Uh, so if you guys are interested in seeing an example problem uh, using the adjoint solver, do let us know, okay? So I'm gonna show you really quickly before we run out of time, how to make geometry changes inside Fluent without having to go back to your CAD. Uh, now I say geometry changes, but remember this is basically mesh morphing, right? You're gonna be either stretching your mesh or you know making changes to your mesh to you know um, at least in this example uh, to determine whether that helps your output or whether that. Um, uh, has the negative impact on the desired output, right? So in this case, same example, same static mixer, what I wanna do is I wanna see if I extend this outlet in the negative Z direction, which is in the upward direction, um, you know, what happens to my outlet temperature? Does it make any change, right? So what I wanna do is I just wanna displace my outlet you know, translate it further in the negative Z direction and then see what kind of effect it has on my um, output temperature. It's not the same thing as goal-driven optimization, right? Because I'm not really defining any goal here, okay? Right now, I'm just doing like a what-if scenario. But if you want to do a goal-driven optimization where you want to get to a certain range or maybe you want to increase something by a certain percentage, you could go ahead and set that up as well, okay? So just keep that in mind, all right? So what I'm gonna go ahead and do is I'm gonna go to this design tab over here. So this is where all the adjoint solver um, business is happening. So in this particular case, because I already have a data file, um, I can just go ahead and you know parameterize and explore a few different things. Uh, this is you know gradient-based optimization. You could also use the design tool for making some of the same changes that I'm going to be showing you. Um, but maybe you know I'll reserve that for another day wherein we use the design tool. Today we are going to use this parameterize and explore option for changing the geometry. Okay, so let me open this up. The moment you open this up, you will notice that there is a blue bounding box that shows up in the graphics window, okay? This bounding box is uh, denoting the region where your mesh morphing will happen or you know where you're focusing your geometry changes. Uh, I want to reduce this because my focus is purely the outlet. I don't want it to be so big. I want the scope to be smaller, okay? So what I'm gonna go ahead and do is I'm gonna go to the region tab over here. I'm going to get the bounds for the outlet itself, okay? So the moment I do that, you can see that there's a smaller 2D bound set up for the outlet only, okay? Now I could go ahead and increase it in the Z direction to um, allow me to make some height changes or like I said, translation in the Z direction changes possible. So I'm going to go ahead and quickly do that. Let me just go ahead and do it. Okay. Okay. So I've just set up this narrow column-like bounding region so that I can extend expand or you know extend my outlet in the negative z direction okay so positive z is in the downward direction negative z is in the upward direction right so i've just gone ahead and set up my bounds and um, i can go ahead and you know assign some design conditions 
to this overall problem. What do I mean by design condition? I'm basically defining the motion in which the mesh is going to move. So I can go ahead and hit create and we are just going to translate the outlet by a little bit, right? So we're not rotating it, we're not scaling it, we're just moving the outlet from its current Z location to a new Z location, right? So I'm gonna go ahead and use translation as the definition of this uh, design condition. And once I choose it, it's gonna ask me which surface I want to translate, okay? So I'm gonna go ahead and hit outlet because that's what I'm going to vary. And in here, I'm not varying anything in X and Y direction. I'm only varying in Z direction. I can go ahead and put uh, minus 0 0.001, okay? Remember I had the bounding region in plus minus 0 0.005. So I'm selecting a value uh, which is less in magnitude, okay? So when I do this, I can go back to the design change tab Okay, I was in design conditions. I've gone back to the design change tab and I can calculate the design change. Okay, this is not actually changing the mesh yet. Okay, this is just giving me the displacement calculation. Uh, you can see that, you know, this value, it corresponds to the number that I just entered under the design condition tab. Okay. Um, before you change the mesh, you want to preview it, right? Because what if the motion of mesh that you just define, or maybe the change that you just define uh, isn't right? You know, you want to make sure that it's doing what you want it to do. So before you go ahead and actually modify the mesh, you want to preview it, okay? So I can go ahead and just preview the mesh and it's gonna show you how the mesh changes inside Fluent based on the design condition that you just defined. So in the console, you can see that it tells you that the current mesh is in white, which is the baseline mesh that you have not modified yet. And the green will be the deformed mesh based on the condition that you just defined, right? I, said I want to move it in the minus C direction by 0 0.001 meter. So that's what it's showing you. So you can see the distinction between the original mesh and the deformed mesh. Now, obviously this outlet looks a bit wobbly. It's not a plain 2D surface. And that's because remember we are morphing the mesh. All these faces had different face normals. So they've gone in different directions and we can change this and fix this, right? You know, there are ways of fixing this and, you know, we can have an extended KVA session on how to get the settings right. But for now, that is not important. For now, I'm just talking about the capability. And you can see that even without stepping out of the Fluent Solver, you can make geometry changes and that helps you predict, you know, what type of approximate shape is going to be the best for you to achieve a certain target, which I think was one of the questions that was asked by the audience earlier. So right now I'm still in the preview mode, by the way, I haven't really modified the mesh. If I wanted to go ahead and modify the mesh, I could go ahead and hit modify, but I'm just gonna go ahead and revert back to the original mesh and just display it one more time. And this has gone back to how it originally used to be. Okay, so now that we've previewed it and checked it, and it makes sense, it's not, you know, some bizarre sort of a mesh, you could be okay with the settings that you've defined. Okay, now how does this connect with the parametric workflow that we've been talking about, right? How does this connect to the overall topic of today's KVA? Well, if you go back to design conditions, look at this value that you've decided. Um, this value doesn't have to be a constant. It can again become a new input parameter, right? So this could be your delta height or you know whatever, just name it however you want to name. And you could just hit okay. And then this becomes another parameter that you can vary in your overall workflow. And unlike the other input parameters in the past, which were based on flow variables, this is an actual geometry parameter that you're changing. So keep in mind that Fluent is such a powerful solver that it also gives you this additional capability.
okay now one thing that i will ask you guys to note is whatever changes you're making right now is always the delta it's not the absolute dimension because you're starting from a reference point and then adding or subtracting from it so say for example you set up various design point tables you want to make sure that at the beginning of each and every design point your mesh reverts back to your original mesh correct because if next time I'm changing the value from 0 0.001 to 0 0.002, I want that to start from this original mesh, not from the new mesh in the previous design point. Okay, so for that, you can, you know, go ahead and um, use some automatic commands, like say, for example, under calculation activities, you could just go ahead and, you know, execute some commands, right? So you could execute it once at iteration number one and you could add some text user interface command so that your mesh is always reverted back to original before your iterations start or before your current calculation starts so if you guys are interested like i also have the commands over here so if you guys want to try it out on your end later on you could just go ahead and add this or you would also just define a macro if you wanted to and it'll automatically get recorded. However, you know, you want to uh, use it depends on how familiar you are with using such ex uh, automatic commands. You could also do, you know, some um, case modification, automatically initialize and, you know, uh, have some pre-initialization conditions available. So every time your design point runs, your mesh starts from the original baseline instead of a deformed mesh from the previous iteration. Okay, so you could go ahead and, you know, just hit this OK. So this command is automatically going to be there. And now when you go ahead and switch to your parametric workflow and initialize this. Now when you go ahead and you know, set this up, you will have your flow variables as input parameters but you'll also have this one guy this delta height that is a, a geometric parameter that you can vary so you can add another design point and just make this 0 0.002 and then when this simulation converges and this one starts it's going to revert the mesh to original and then restart the calculation okay so in the interest of saving time, I'm not going to do this simulation at this point. But like I said, if you guys are interested in uh, a full session on the adjoint solver capabilities, please let us know in the comments and we'd be happy to uh, go back to that and, you know, uh, show you how goal-driven optimization can be done inside Fluent. Okay. All right. So that's all I had to show for the demo. Let me quickly go back to my slides because I did want to cover the latest capabilities inside the Fluent um, Parametric Workflow um, Solver. So like I said, um, now you can do concurrent updates in distributed computing environments. You don't have to use a single shared memory machine. Um, by the way, even with the GPU solver, so right now I'm using CPUs, but even if you're using a GPU solver, you can do sequential design point updates. The parametric workflow is also available with the GPU solver. Uh, you can leverage your HPC parametric licensing for making some of these runs more efficient. Um, and, you know, you can go ahead and have conditional formatting of design point uh, results in your report that is generated. Uh, like I said, you can offer of course, create your DOE using OptiSlang like I showed you, but you could also just open this parametric study inside OptiSlang and do further um, uh, computations and post-processing inside OptiSlang itself. And uh, you can initialize from previous design point, right? So if you have design point two already solved, design point three can start from that solution. It doesn't have to go back to your baseline design and you know, initialize from the very beginning, right? So it doesn't um, just remove the solution that has already been calculated for previous design points. And the benefit of that is your convergence can be much faster. So you're not 
running the simulation from iteration one then, okay? Uh, you can report the export in PowerPoint format, and you can also just automatically uh, have mesh morphing updates like I showed you, okay? So that's all I wanted to cover in today's session. Um, hope this was useful and hope you guys play around with it a little bit more um, just to fully understand the capabilities of the Fluent Solver and leverage it to make better design decisions. If you guys have any questions about the content that I covered today, please feel free to leave it in the Q&A box at this point. I can take those questions and answer accordingly. Okay, I don't see any questions at the moment. Uh, Christina, I don't know if you had anything else to add. Uh, no, I don't. We will have a replay of this session that will get sent out tomorrow. So please be on the lookout for that. And thank you everyone for joining. We will see you at next week's session. Thank you so much, Snigda. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Have a great day, everyone. Bye.